Our next speaker is David uh, Stewart. Uh, he is a CEO of uh, Critical Blue, and he will talk about uh, API abuse, comprehension, and prevention. Hello, David. Can you share your slide? Great. You see them now? Yeah, nice and clear. OK, Fantastic. then I will pass the time to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Well, um, I'm uh, I'm here to talk to you today about API abuse, and um, it's a it's a real pleasure to to be able to to come along and uh, and share some of our experiences uh, with you. What I'd like to do today is to is to explain what API abuse is, um, and and also um, the reasons that people do it and give you some some real live case studies of um, of what goes on and um, and why you know what you can do about it to to make things better for your for your environment now this is an api conference so i certainly don't need to explain to you um, what an api is uh, nor do i need to explain to you um, how prevalent they are um, in business these days because obviously you're all you're already using them um, what may not be quite so obvious to you is that they are a significant weakness. I mean, APIs were um, were deployed at great speed um, during the last several years, but um, the security implications of um, deploying lots of APIs were not clearly understood or, or considered at the early point of the API um, growth. The good news is that um, maturity is coming to the market and people are taking security of apis a lot more seriously now than they they used to the um the garner quote on the right hand side here is probably one you've seen before um that api abuse and and by api abuse i mean uh, unauth unauthorized access to apis or using apis in ways for which they were not designed um is the mo is is going to be the most uh, frequent attack vector for data breaches and um I think from what we're seeing from our business, I think that's definitely um, definitely going to be true. Um, the other thing is since, you know, obviously you have a focus on, on FinTech um, as a service at this particular conference, um, it's interesting to think about the uh, implication of uh, fraudulent activity within FinTechs. And there's a report that you can read here that, that explains that for every dollar that um, that is, is processed uh, in a fraudulent transaction it impacts three dollars in terms of the profit of the business itself the fintech business itself so it has a very significant impact and uh, when i go into some of the case studies um, you'll see you'll see how that that is definitely true now the what what an important thing that i want to uh, message i want to deliver to you today today is that um, you can actually reduce um, the business costs in your fintech platform due to um, fraudulent activity by um, at least 90% within uh, within 30 days. And that's what we've seen um, from the case studies that I'll go through. Um, and what I want to do to, today is explain to you um, how we do that. Now, um, perhaps I don't need to say this, um, but um, sometimes um, people I speak to are, are unsure of what, whether API abuse is really a real thing. Um, and And, there are so many examples of uh, API abuses, API or, or breaches via APIs, et cetera, that um, is very much a definitely a real thing. And uh, the financial services sector is uh, is one of the sectors, not the only one, but one of the sectors where it happens a lot. And in these kinds of articles, I just happen to have picked a random uh, Nordic APIs article, but these kinds of articles, um, they tend to, to focus on the bigger companies. Um, but what I can tell you is that this is a, a problem for um, any companies. So um, one of the myths I want to explode today is that um, this only happens to big companies. It doesn't. Uh, so even if you're a, a small um, fintech with, with um, plans to grow really big, uh, you should be thinking about this right now. And in fact, there is almost certainly, um, there, there is uh, fraudulent activity on your APIs already. Even if you only have a few users, uh, there will be some there already. And so um, it's really smart to uh, to get this problem dealt with um, sooner rather than later. Now, 
one of the questions that comes up is why would somebody do this? Why would people abuse the APIs? And there's actually lots and lots of different reasons. Um, and some of them I'll go through in the case studies, but I'll just pick on a couple that I won't, I won't uh, mention in the case studies. Um, so um, data scraping is one that happens quite a lot. So this is where somebody might scrape data from the API in order to, it might be to get um, personal information, but, but actually one of the most common data scraping um, activities is to, is to gain competitive advantage by you know, scraping um, uh, data or uh, you know, maybe pricing, product availability, et cetera, in order to be able to take a competitive position. Um, and all of that can be automated so that you know you can check pricing every day and uh, and then you know uh, and then set your own pricing accordingly. Um, app impersonation, sometimes called presentation attacks, is another thing um, that happens that happens a lot in financial services too. So this is where you have a modified app, um, an app which is uh, it looks like your own app, but it's actually um, somebody's modified it so that it does something different under the hood. So um, you 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 trick the, uh, the the real user into entering credentials and authorizing a transaction, um, but actually something else happens underneath, uh, and that's another another way in which the APIs can be a u can be used um, in this case via a, a mobile app. But fundamentally, the reason why people abuse your API is because they can, and um, if you give them the opportunity to do it, if there's a way to make money, if there's a way to cause trouble. Um, um, then they will uh, they will do it. Um, so that's why I'm saying that um, if you have designs on on being you know one of the next big fintechs, and I hope you all do, then um, please take care of this issue uh, as soon as you can. Now, just to clarify a little bit, there's there's kind of two different classes of API abuse, um, and the one on the left, um, often called API vulnerability relates to there being um, bugs, mistakes, design errors, et cetera, in the API uh, design or implementation, such that if you approach the API in a certain way from a certain angle or with certain data, um, it, will, it will malfunction, and that malfunction can be exploited to extract data, et cetera. And, and that's largely what the uh, OWASP um, activities and, and that top 10 uh, covers, and that's an important topic, absolutely. But I think that's not the kind of API abuse I'm going to talk about today. Um, what I'm talking about is API abuse from scripts and bots, which are essentially uh, impersonating the traffic, uh, genuine traffic, and this uh, makes it a really, really difficult problem to to solve. Um, it makes it very difficult for you as the the platform provider to be able to tell the difference between traffic which is coming from a genuine instance of um, your remote client, um, probably a mobile app, um, and, and uh, you know, the traffic which is coming from something which is a script or a bot which is being, uh, which is impersonating that traffic. Um, so uh, one thing to think about actually is, you know, if, it, you know, how would you, how would you tell the difference within your current uh, security setup? How would you be able to tell the difference between traffic, which is coming from your mobile app and traffic, which is using valid credentials, using exactly the correct API protocol, um, using same, you know, um, frequency of transaction, et cetera. How would you tell the difference? And the answer is it's really, really difficult. Now I'm talking about mobile, and mobile is our is our is our is our space actually, um, and it's the most difficult of the different APIs to protect. Uh, and I just want to cover a couple of main reasons why that is. Um, so the challenge is uh, is made more difficult for two reasons. The first reason is that a mobile app can be downloaded from app stores by anyone, um, and you have no information about who's downloading it. Um, also, they can study the app and the API traffic for as long as they want. They can reverse engineer the apps if they can, but they don't even need to do that. They may just want to look at the app in action, um, watch the API traffic, understand the protocols you're using. Um, then if they have ways to get access to credentials, then they can then start to build scripts that will look exactly like the traffic coming from, from a, a genuine app. 
So that's one reason that, that makes the, the, uh, the mobile channel really difficult to defend. The related topic is that, um, is that anything you store in the app um, is vulnerable to being extracted. And um, it, you really need to assume that uh, anything coming from the claiming to come from the mobile app is, is unsafe. And you need to independently authenticate and validate that, that, it, that it is what it says it is. The second thing is that um, the, the mobile app actually creates a sort of natural bottleneck to, to data extraction. So because of the, of the way the apps are designed, the way you'll probably design it, it'll be designed for a single user to use. It'll be designed for a single, single probably a single piece of data or a single uh, group of data to be extracted from the back end in any one transaction. So um, it limits how much can be done. But again, think about it from your own platform. If you took that mobile app away, and then you were able to connect a script there, how quickly could you extract large amounts of data from the backend system? And, um, and, and the answer may well be uh, quite quickly. And that's what we, we typically see. So before getting into the case studies, it did strike me that um, perhaps we should I should explain um, you know who approve is um, and 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 I've I've used two pictures of me just to indicate that we've been around a while, um, although I, I do look happier in the uh, in the in the more recent picture, um, so that must tell you something. But it's not about me, of course. Uh, we have a a, a really um, fantastic team of people that have been working together for a very long time. We have a very deep expertise in the um, very deep and low level analysis of software. Um, we, over five years ago, recognized that the, the, the things I just talked about, about the mobile channel being different, about the need for um, a, a dedicated security solution for specifically the API piece. So the piece that would allow you to, with confidence, know that your API, incoming API requests, are actually coming from your mobile app. Uh, and the Proof Solution um, has been live since 2016. Um, I will go into a little bit of detail about it later on. Um, and we've been you know, recognized by various um, you know, events and organizations, um, analysts, et cetera, over the years too. So we, we do come from a position of um, a lot of knowledge um, of what's going on working with our customers and building the solution that we've built over um, several years. Uh, more years than I, I I care to think about, but anyway, that's uh, that's who we are. Um, so let's get back to the big claim. We 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 want, and I assume you want, to reduce that bad traffic by ninety percent in thirty days. And you know, there's lots of different options, lots of different things that you could do. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these, but I'm just going to pick on uh, a few of them. Um, Obviously, uh, user authentication is something that uh, comes up a lot, and, and most of our customers use user authentication alongside the solutions that we use. And, and user authentication is clearly an important uh, technology, and, and most platforms will use that. But it is not um, a, a in and of itself security solution, in particular for the use cases that I, I'm talking about. Um, uh, TLS and related uh, um, security approaches for um, data in motion. Um, again, TLS is something that's been uh, mandatory, I think, on Android and iOS for the last several years, um, and and that's a good thing. Um, but it's not too difficult to uh, to decrypt that traffic and be able to read it. And um, as I say, I don't have time to go through all the details of that. But if if anybody wants to to follow up with me on any of these topics here, I'd be happy to share some resources about um, you know the, the the pluses and minuses of these kinds of approaches. Um, so man in the middle attacks can um, can quite easily uh, uh, read traffic even in um, encrypted channels. Certificate pinning is another, um, another thing that, uh, that gets used, and we do recommend that people pin their connections. Um, not all customers do, um, but it is a, a good step forward. Unfortunately, it can also be um, undone, and there are good examples of uh, how you can um, unpin uh, channels uh, as well. And also certificate pinning and, and concerns around certificate pinning uh, sometimes cause people not to implement it because they're worried about um, certificate management, um, revoking certificates, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a complicated uh, topic. 
um, and, and not a 100% secure one. App shielding, um, so this is where you're protecting the mobile app itself and making sure that it's very, very difficult to reverse engineer it. Um, in some uh, some vertical sectors, that's, uh, that's a very good approach, um, but it doesn't secure the API channel. Um, because if um, the if credentials do become available through some other route, then it means the API can still be used by bypassing the app. So shielding the app is a good thing to do, but again, doesn't solve the API uh, problem directly. Um, homegrown security, well, uh, you can try and do it yourself if you like. Um, there are some amazingly good uh, tools and technologies out there for um, for doing this kind of um, work of you know intercepting traffic um, unpinning things um, you know just just basically being able to pull apart applications pull apart apis so if you're going to get into this remember that it's not just a question of fixing the security right now you you have to sign up to the uh, the longer term implications of uh, having to maintain that and um, as I say there's so many, free and open source tools out there that and well well documented uh, stuff too that it's a it's a big commitment if you do decide to go down that path so let me talk about a couple of case studies and this is the the the, the, the headline one so this is the one where um we've we've been able to see this dramatic drop in fraudulent traffic so this is a a, a fintech that we've been working with for some time they had probably tens of thousands of users when we started i think they're somewhere between one and two million um, and that's monthly active users on the platform now growing extremely fast. Um, they experienced um, quite a bit of fraudulent traffic, different kinds of uh, activities. One activity is that they have merchant accounts and they have personal accounts. Merchant accounts attract uh, fees for transactions, personal accounts do not. So um, there were examples of um, people automatically creating many, many personal accounts in order to be able then to you know, move money around um, in, a, in a way that, uh, that didn't attract fees. Um, Phishing attacks where people would be, uh, services would be offered around the FinTech platform on websites. And to get those, to, for those services to work, you had to enter your credentials. The credentials are then used to take over accounts, empty them of money, um, use them for other purposes, et cetera. Um, the third uh, angle would be rewards. So you get rewards for opening new accounts. Uh, you get, uh, you might get, you know, Netflix subscriptions, things like that. And, you know, you may think, well, why would anybody bother with that? Well, the answer is if you can create hundreds of accounts and each one of them has got a free Netflix subscription and then you can combine it all together and, and there's a there's a healthy secondary market for making money from that. So it, there's there's so many different uh, angles here. And um, they they were beginning to see, because of their phenomenal growth, they were beginning to see significant um, impacts on their backend services because of all the additional traffic, the costs of running those services, and obviously um, the revenue loss because they weren't picking up fees that they should should have picked up. And then uh, obviously a knock-on effect is there's there's always going to be some some brand reputational damage because they get a reputation for um, for having you know lots of fake accounts and things like that within the system. So they really wanted to do something about this. Um, they they integrated our, our product into the into their uh, platform in seven days. Spent the rest of the thirty days looking at it, making sure everything was working okay, monitoring it, and then switched it on. And so, and immediately saw the cost dropping by ninety percent. So it really was a, a, a really a real example, um, nothing particularly special about it. Um, you can benefit in this way too, and I'll come very shortly to explain how. This one's not FinTech, but it talks about aggregators, and aggregators are something that um, we do, you do see in FinTech too. So here's a situation where third-party mobile apps are using the API, in this case of six to pull information out, which they then present in their own app. And this is very difficult for Six to, to keep control of because they couldn't tell the difference between an API request coming from their own mobile app and an API request coming from an aggregator's app. And so I think you can immediately see the parallel between this and uh, what goes on in FinTech. So um, 
you know, I'll, I'll leave that one uh, with you in the interest of time. These are all on our website, by the way. So you can go and read these case studies in detail on the website um, and understand more about it. But um, this, is a, this is an issue in, in, in the financial services sector as well. Okay, so this approved thing that I've been talking about for the last um, 15 minutes. Um, so what does it do? Well, when it's in your app, um, your app starts up, it will um, communicate, there's an SDK in here, which will communicate with the cloud service, um, our cloud service, and do a sort of DNA test of the app to make sure the app is present and make sure it's not been modified, make sure it's running in a safe environment. The um, a short lifetime token is then passed back to the app, and then you pass that, the, 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 the SDK then passes that to your backend so you can verify that the um, API request has come from a genuine instance of your of your app. So a slightly more detailed picture of, of how it all works. Um, the important thing that I want to get across to you here is that the um, two components, the SDK and the approved cloud service, have no impact on um, how your app works or um, the user experience that your um, your users using the app will have. The um, authentication process, that DNA test I mentioned, um, is uh, will take you know less than um, between 100 and 200 milliseconds to execute. We do it every five minutes, um, so we're constantly checking that the app is present and the app is not being modified. Um, we also don't sit in your traffic. Your traffic is going down the slide. So the API we're protecting is going down the slide between, between the mobile app and your backend systems. And that's what, uh, and so we don't sit in that traffic. So we have no impact on your, um, your uh, latency of your platform and no impact on your user experience. For the application developer, you basically drop the SDK in and call it. And the SDK manages all the comms between uh, the app and the cloud service, as well as managing the short lifetime tokens, etc. So it's really very simple. And then before you load it up into the into the app stores, you register the app with the cloud service, which is when we extract the DNA that we'll test later, and then um, we uh, we we go forward from there. Very very simple. We have support for lots of different. Um, platforms, the native platforms, but also lots of third parties. Again, this is from our website, so you can go there and see all the different platforms that we support. And we have, you know, quick start guides for all of these. On the back end, again, a very similar story. You're checking a standard JWT token. Um, so it's a short lifetime. You just check the expiry date and the secret, and then you're all set to go. So it's very, very easy to implement in your, uh, in your back end. And again, this is just a subset of what we support. There's a load of different backends, uh, languages, and environments that we support. So again, you'll find on the website lots of quick start guides uh, that will help you get, get up and running uh, very quickly. So coming to the end here, the API abuse, this is what it should look like. This is from our um, dashboard analytics. Um, so I haven't touched on analytics at all but there's lots of analytics you get with the service that allows you to see what's going on and monitor um, you know, the, the, the demographics of how your app is being used, um, you know, passes and fails of the authentication process, et cetera. But here you see the steady state um, green, which is your, your genuine users uh, using the app and having success. And then you've got an, an attack. This is a credential stuffing attack. Um, coming along and you see some higher volumes and it's all red, which means it's all being blocked. But the important thing here is you see that the genuine traffic continues um, uninterrupted. Um, so the users don't even know that you're under attack. Um, and eventually the attackers give up and go away somewhere else where um, where people are not, are not taking API security seriously and they may be successful with their credential stuffing attack uh, with those guys. So then, just to, to summarize, um, uh, there is an opportunity for you to reduce the costs uh, of fraud in your platform by 90% uh, in 30 days. And um, there may be some of you thinking that you don't have any fraudulent activity on your platform, but I uh, would be pretty sure that you do. Um, it may be that you don't know about it, um, but it definitely exists. And that's what we've seen over and over again with the, with the customers uh, that we have. The APIs, um, as I mentioned, mobile APIs or APIs that service mobile apps um, is, 
is probably the highest risk uh, area that you have. So please take it seriously and, and remember that you need to, you really should have some sort of dedicated solution for this. Hmm. Do do some um, thoughts about um, you know how how your data could be extracted, and modified at scale, just to think about the security risks that you have, and remember to also not just think about who's on your API, but what is actually communicating with you. Hmm. All right, and that's me. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much for David's presentation and. It is a very great presentation on API abuse. And thank you, David. 